architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we try and have a conversation with a contemporary thinker or practitioner or creative artist to try and advance our own understanding of architecture and architectural thinking. We are trying to explore uh, new horizons of possibility uh, by learning from practitioners and thinkers from a diversity of disciplines. And that is certainly what I'm doing today. I'm having a conversation with the rather brilliant Chinese-American composer Bright Sheng, conductor, pianist, uh, besides a composer. Bright Sheng is one of the MacArthur geniuses who has produced a vast repertoire of uh, projects, of works for opera, theater, ballet, orchestra, uh, for traditional Chinese instruments, band, chorus, uh, and so on. I happened to be present at a performance uh, of his works, which he participated in, in which I thought that his notes suggested that he had an affinity and some understanding of architecture, because the quartet that was performed he recorded as being uh, inspired by a particular Tibetan Chinese uh, monastery that had been abandoned. So I wrote to him and I said, Bright, can we have a conversation of the possibilities of architectural thinking? And he agreed. And here's the conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for being on Architecture Talk. I was very excited to be listening into your concert at the uh, Miller Theater in Columbia a few weeks ago. Beautiful set of pieces composed by you. And I thought it'd be great to have this conversation because I was very intrigued by the description of uh, one of your pieces, which I think is called Silent Temple. And if I may read from the notes that I have in front of me, you have described it as being inspired you say here, I visited an abandoned Buddhist temple in northwest China. As all religious activities were completely forbidden at the time of the Cultural Revolution, the temple renowned amongst the Buddhist community all over the world was unattended and on the brim of turning into a ruin. The most striking and powerful memory I had for the visit was that in spite of the appalling condition of the temple, it was still in grandiose and magnificent structure. To this day, the memories of the visit remain vivid. I use them almost randomly. I use them almost randomly as the basic images of the composition. And then you say, as a result, as a result, the work has four short seemingly unrelated movements which should be performed without pause. And I heard them. Uh, and it seems to me uh, some of the movements are much quieter and contemplative, then there's a movement in which there is sort of a lot of active movement uh, and sort of uh, rising to a sense of crescendo and then a final movement which seems as, has a little more quiescence. So as a composer, I'm very intrigued by this. What is it about a, a temple, which I'm simply going to call architecture here, what is it about this architectural work that arises music for you as a composer. How does this happen? Well, um, this uh, piece was inspired not only by the architecture, but then also what happened mm -hmm. to the architecture, of to course. the temple, and, 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 and the history of the temple. And that temple is called the Tower Temple, which yep. is outside um, Xining, um, which is the capital of a province where I stayed for seven years from my teenager years. And uh, the temple is very famous. It's, it's for all the Western Tibet. You know, where I lived, it was 
called Eastern Tibet, used to be called Eastern Tibet. So、mm-hmm. where where we call Tibet in Chinese is Xizang, which means literally Western Tibet. So、right. Qinghai used to be Eastern Tibet. Only in the last few hundred years they kind of changed the name. But they still remain the Tibet part, still call it in Chinese Western Tibet. So for Dalai Lama and all these important、uh, religious leaders, when they come to Beijing、uh, through through the inner part of China, right?、Uh, they used to, you know, this use this part. Yeah, they、so、used they stay there. So it's a very famous, uh, 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 big actually quite big、uh, temple, and now it's open. It's it's renovated. It's open. But at the time, was、uh, it was you know it was in, not in a good shape. So what you know what we were、um, visiting, we were allowed to really open. And to get in the gate to open, and it was quite a scene because even I didn't say this in in the program though.、Mm-hmm. And it was what's powerful and touching was was in the morning for some some reason that the word got out that the door of the temple will be open. So when we arrived,、uh, there were hundreds of Tibetans crawling on the floor. Oh really? Waiting for the gate to open just to have. You know, it probably means a great deal to them when the gate of the temple opened. But of course,、uh, when when they saw the situation, they didn't open the gate. They let us in the back door. So, but we got in and we didn't spend, you know, maybe an hour or two there. And I I I just remember this this、um, grand. You know, it's a typical a Chinese、um, a Buddhist monastery kind of、uh, setting. So you have a big courtyard in the middle, and you、right. have houses、uh, built on the side.、Mm-hmm. And、uh, so that was that was the memory I had, and it was very very quiet. There's、mm-hmm. no noise,、mm-hmm. no disturbing noise, and all that. So, and looking at that, it was the winter time, and looking at the out. See the snowy mountains, and there was there was a very powerful image that I had remembered. And now <clears throat> I don't know if it's accidental that they have those, you know, their their four movements. You know, right? Square、uh, is、four. the courtyard is square. Yeah.、Hmm, so、interesting. Yeah. I don't know if it's accidental, but I do feel that in my composition in general. Structure is the main th- concern.、Mm. I often tell my students that when we listen to a new piece, assuming you are open-minded with the styles, right, which means the language they they speak, and and what makes the piece、uh, a new composition fail or successful is the structure. So if the structure is a sound structure, the composition will stand. I see.、Um, very architectural、uh, metaphors, all of these. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a very. I don't know if how that relates to architecture, but I think a structure. And then you know, in composition, how you how do you define a structure? Good structure versus a bad structure.、Um, so, though these are the things that we were, you know, been working on for decades,、uh, all my life, try to try to find, you know, some kind of. Um, understanding of a good structure.、Um, I don't know if you like a Mahler, Gustav Mahler,、um, sure, yeah. his symphonies. I、yeah. think he was he was searching for the same thing that、uh, every comp- every symphony he wrote. He tried to tell the same story with different kind of structure.、Mm. How would you describe your structure? I mean, what is the?、Uh, I mean, it's four parts, of course, but within it. How you move your music?、Uh, how what is this sort of structural characteristic that holds it up?、So、you mean for the quartet, for the string for, quartet, for, for this quartet? Yeah. Well, I I don't know. I mean, I was this was、um, one piece I、uh, remember because of because of this image. I didn't really start with a a plan, so to speak.、Huh. Normally, I do. Hmm. I just saw let of、uh, let kind of flow whatever comes to mind. The f- certainly the first two movements is very much in that manner. I kind of didn't 
deliberately do not want to have much a plan and it just starts with whatever comes to mind and just wanders off with with that and so in the first two movements that you remember as you remember right. um, they are kind of a free wheeling kind of going and very quiet generally and mm -hmm. then only the third movement start to pick up uh, the momentum and, right. and and set up for the for the last movement, mm. uh, which you have kind of a loud cry out right. uh, moment before it ends. So, well, that by then I think I planned. By the time I got to the third movement, the fourth movement, I I need to have a setup uh, in theater. We call it a setup, and and then you have a climax, uh -huh. unexpected, and and so. But in composition, I often say the two things that I, I ask my students and myself mm -hmm. to do there there's there's a, you ask a question of where is the most exciting uh, moment of the piece uh -huh. and where is the most touching moment of the piece right right the touching as you heard in my uh, conversation in, in uh, during the intermission at the miller probably mm -hmm. and you know it's very important to me that that's when you move if you move the audience when when audience right. in your piece then you right. succeeded right. so to me that's how you define the architecture of the composition yeah. <laughs> um, but, i uh, mean in many ways i'd say that's the architecture the desire desire of architecture to Le Corbusier used to say that if i if i move you when you enter my building and i move you exactly same word uh then i have succeeded so yeah, that's that's very important. Moving is is I I never thought of architecture moving, but yeah, that's that's really. Well, it seems that it's then the monastery must have did move you right in certain ways. Yes. So so when you were sort of kind of I don't know what the term would be. Let's say free associating and producing the first two pieces. Uh, did you have a image of the monastery sort of running through your head? Uh, I mean, I mean that literally uh, in terms of your visit to the temple or or uh, was it more emotional in terms of your reaction to the visit? I, I don't remember. have, I don't, I don't really think, well, when I write operas or yeah. dance pieces mm -hmm. and I think about image, music image should describe the scene that's, right right it's more more you know more apt for me to do that but when abstract music like this mm -hmm. um it's more an inspiration so so the the reason that i was i i chose that to write kind of freely mm -hmm. without much planning it was usually you know when i have the first minute or so i have pretty much sketch out of the shape of the piece. You really the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, I usually yeah, I usually figure it out. Uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a blueprint. But you know, you don't as architecture when you when you actually do the building construction, yeah, yeah. you modify. Else. You yeah, modify. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> so, amazing. Another architectural blueprint. You know, you are very yes, architecturally yeah, I, spoke. Yeah. <laughs> but I I don't write it down. It's all mm. in my mind. I yeah. I sometimes at the most that I. I'll write down some sentences that just to describe, so I won't forget. But mm. mostly, it's just in my mind how the how the composition sort of a vague blueprint. I, I could think of just only few pieces in my uh, experience that I just let it go free, and sometimes the result is is quite good, and the result is actually quite the same. At the end, you still have to look back and check back, and make sure the structurally it works so it's it's just the process is slightly different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so so the image that i that i had for the first two movements is just kind of uh, these images i don't think they are literally as you know music really cannot describe anything it's, right it's, you know you can't really associate it with anything it's it touches the a special nerve in one's body and so you know it, it that's what so wonderful about music is you can't replace by any other art form right you combine that with other art form but you can't replace that so um, in complete abstract sense that that music is it is what it is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they describe uh, to sort of risk a cliche architecture is kind of frozen music 
I'm not sure exactly how that would uh, translate in terms of how you're describing it. Well, in a sense, I think a frozen music is music is an art form that uh, has a lineage. So you you gotta have this timing. So you have mm-hmm. one second, another second. It's like a movie or a really right, novel. Right, right, right. Yeah. Like so the the art form is is through the passing of time, mm-hmm. and then you have the structure. Whereas architecture or visual art, you the structure is is right in front of you. Right. So instant. That's, yeah. Yeah. Instant, and you have everything in you, and then you then you try to digest it, that appreciate mm-hmm. it right. through time. Yeah, and one can sort. That's right. I think that would be the difference. But both have, in a sense, structure, rhythm, order, beginnings, entrances, climaxes, central spaces, uh, and embellishment. Uh, I would probably say. Would you say there is sort of color? Would you say there is color and material yeah. in music? Sure, definitely. We call it timbre. Yeah. Color and timbre. Yeah. What do you mean? What is color in in music for you? Color is just a different timbre. It's just you know you could like a good example. Ravel has very colorful orchestration. He's a master of that. So people, you know, you you have Brahms, for example, and it's very dark. There are certain ways that you do Brahms, the orchestration that comes out mm-hmm. that uh, it's people perceive it as profound. Mm-hmm. And then, and then you have somebody like Ravel, or, or you know Stravinsky, and they're sure. they're very colorful with with different tempos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's those are the colors that you can't really associate it with a real color, red or white. I mean, you could people do that, attach them, but I don't think it, it's uniform. Different people would have different perception of what color is. Right, and then you know, then there's also uh, people, you know, uh, color blind, and then of people, course, of course, yeah, yeah. they have those hey. they see everything black and white, and then but they can still perceive music and uh, uh, the color. Right. So you said that you know when you are composing operas, you you sort of write more directedly towards the scene and its construction and its visuality. But not necessarily in this piece. Uh, like you felt that this piece was much more uh, abstract. I think was your term uh, and and self-standing. So would you talk to me a little bit more about you know how you write to a scene, so to speak, uh, when you are doing say opera or or other things? What is the difference here between uh, this kind of type of composition and that type of composition? Well, when I when I write opera. Um, you know, it's there's a drama, there's a story goes on. Mm-hmm. So some people write music with we call the programmatic ideas. But even when I write programmatic ideas, I think of some images. Like I have written a piece about the Cultural Revolution or right. about yes, of course. Yeah. the rape of Nanking. Yeah. These kind of things that I thought associated with violence and lament and uh, anger. You know that kind of thing, and then or oh, description of the violence. So you have these images. So in the opera, where you have a specific scene, for example, people just a market. You know, you go to a, mm-hmm. a, a, a supermarket or a fair, fairy, and there are a lot of people going on. And so you need to describe. You know, and then you see it on the on the stage. You have these these things that the visual part, the mm-hmm. people walking around. You have a market, and then the music is bubbly, uh, busy. Uh, so that helps you to to describe it. But if you take out all the programmatic ideas and the, the visual aids, mm-hmm. and then what you just play the music, it could be something completely different. But you get some kind of character or the mood of the composition that helps you to enhance. The drama, yeah,、uh, you know, like a, the beginning of Puccini's Madame Butterfly. Of course, yeah. He was de- 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 describing the、um, a, a busy wedding scene, and a lot of people doing a lot of things at the same time. The wedding scene, people running around, and so he's that did that, you know, that did it very fast, and a lot of things going on. Is、uh, you know, so he he describes using the music, but but people. 
I've seen productions, there's nothing happens. When the music was busily played, uh -huh. it was his intention originally. Uh -huh. uh, just a, a, a wedding, a lot of people running around, to set up the, uh, you know, for the house and the room and all that. But, but some production director was totally against it. There's nothing going on. Mm. So the music either evokes that or describes something very different. It's like a ironic, it's in contrary to what you see. So that's another way of, of approaching. Yeah, really. but one can take an opera and, you know, of course, listen to it without uh, any, uh, without the scene. I mean, you can just listen to the opera as a piece of music and that's quite fantastic in and of itself, right? But sort of inversely, I mean, a question that occurs to me is, would it be of interest for you to have this piece, the four-part piece on the temple, performed in the temple at the Thayer, would that be meaningful for you? That would be quite, yeah, that would be an interesting experience, you know. That was, <laughs> I never thought of that. That would uh -huh. be very meaningful, yeah. Yeah, why yeah. so? Yeah, why? I, why? I, well, I don't know. I mean, it's just the, what inspired me and it brings the piece to where it inspires me. Mm -hmm. You know, like I wrote a piece called the Nanking Nanking, which is about, you know, the, the rape of Nanking, yeah. the, yeah. the Second World War. Right. And it was never played in Nanking. It was played in other play, parts in China. It was never uh, played in Nanking. So uh, they're working on it to do it, you know, for a special occasion. Right. In Nanking, so we'll see. I think that would be amazing to have it performed in Nanking. Uh, but in a sense, if you had the opportunity to have this performed at the temple, at the Thayer, how would you imagine it? I mean, would you like it to be at a certain time? Would you like it to be in the open? Would it be interesting to simply perform the music with no audience or would it be relevant with a big audience? Can one play it to the temple, so to speak? So I would think I would want it to, to have an audience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the larger, the better. And the problem is the acoustics. I mean, the temple of is course. not, you know, the intricacy <laughs> of the string quartet that uh, and also the audience depends on what the audience. I don't know if the Tibetans that. And most of the people living in that area would really understand much of what I try to say, or they, they never heard the music in that kind of genre and, mm -hmm. and in that kind of language, and they right. probably a little bit turned off by it. But uh, who knows? But it still would be uh, that's a great idea. We should have a festival there. Yes, yes, in the yes. Summer, in the summer, and it's cool and quiet. And uh, and to establish a summer festival there, they have lots of uh, folk song festival in the area no. uh, in July, and so you know it, it would be quite something if it's played there. But it's mostly meaningful to me, I think, and for perhaps the monks. I don't know for the you know at the time the monks were all uh, sent back to their home mm -hmm. and just couple old monks was kind of keep keep up with the place just you know the weather there is very harsh mostly winter and snow so it's it it, it, it does you know it damages the architect you know the uh, housing and it mostly mm. builds with wood uh, uh, right, very right. quickly yeah yeah and if you don't maintain it regularly right. but let's come back to this uh, what you started to talk about the the question of translation and the problem of translation and you were you were concerned about uh, whether or not uh, the Buddhist monks would appreciate your um, music. And that's because, uh, in many ways, of course, you, you write in a comp compositional style, which is very contemporary, and I would say very American in, in some ways, modern American. Uh, and at the same time, you are, of course, well known for bringing here in the United States, you know, movements, ethoses, feelings about musics that could be described as being, uh, you know, Chinese uh, in origin in some way. So you're translating uh, something that could be uh, considered in foreign here in, in America, uh, very much as American music. But at the same, you know, and there is also, but there is a problem, there is difficulty there rather than a problem, as you identified with how would one port contemporary American music back to a monastery in Tibet. 
So would you talk to me a little bit more about this, uh, you know, abiding interest you have in, let's first say, translating uh, a certain Chinese idiom? Into well, that, Chinese. yeah, well, I think of music is a, is a culture, any culture, there's, there's a cultural background, there's a right. barriers. Mm. Uh, that's why we, uh, you know, that's why people like me, our job is to bridge the barriers and the, the different cultures. Mm-hmm. Um, but once they get used to and start to appreciate it's like a food you know mm-hmm. if you never taste a certain food you say what is that right but once you get uh, appreciated to i remember the first time i had a new york pizza that <laughs> you know 40 years ago when i arrived i said well that tastes terrible right uh you know but for, for my daughter who grew up here pizza is wonderful you know mm-hmm. um so i think it's a cultural burial that uh, one has to go i have a story to tell you i remember uh my teacher and the mentor, Lena Bernstein, when they told me, he said, you know, this Indian uh, raga music. You yeah, know, yeah. Because uh, this is related to you, you know, Ravi yes, Shankar, yes. you know. Of course, of course. He said, he one day he told me, he said, do you know Ravi Shankar? Uh-huh. I said, well, I said, I heard his name. I Because, you know, that was years ago. Right. I didn't really get into Indian music, uh-huh. he said, "You know that music that goes on any time and could could go on forever and you uh-huh. could end anywhere." Yeah. So that shows the the, the misunderstanding cultural barrier for Bernstein, who is a, a great musician who is right, also right, right. Yeah. very right. open ideas, yeah. but he uh-huh. didn't really understand Ravi Shankar's music. So, so he said, "One day I invited Ravi Shankar to my concert at Tango with the Boston Symphony." Uh-huh. And uh, I said, what did you play? He said, uh-huh. I played the Mozart Symphony. Afterwards, I asked him, what does he think of the Mozart? And Ravi Shankar said, that's the most boring music I've ever heard. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. I mean, later on, now, as we know, later yeah. on, Ravi Shankar actually wrote pieces for himself and for symphony orchestras. Yeah. So... At the beginning, when people are unfamiliar with the other territory, you know, it's just like a, you need an interpreter. Right. And later on, the, the language, you know, you have Creoles, you have pigeons, as, as a linguist would tell you, you know. So you mm-hmm. have these things start to bridge uh, the language. And then you get more uh, as a, like a full language because the va- vocabulary you share is more more descriptive, has more uh, adjectives for example mm-hmm. would you describe your music as kind of bridging a kind of a introduction of uh, I, I Chinese think it, it could be a, just a byproduct you know at the beginning i think because of my uh, unique life story i lived in different cultures mm-hmm. so so you was you would normally hope that your work would do the do the function as such mm-hmm. but later on um, I consider less like now I'm writing. I don't know whether music sounds, my music sounds uh, uh, Western or Chinese. I, it doesn't really, I don't really, it's not my main concern. But mm-hmm. it's interesting when my music is played here or in China, uh, I get the same reaction okay. and they, they were moved. But maybe because the, the audience in China also are classical music audience, or at least they had some kind of music. Not mm-hmm. all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, recently, I had all my music uh, done uh, in China. Uh, so I invited my high school kid, uh, friends, you know, my, my primary school, some of my primary school friends, who are not mm-hmm. musicians who don't regularly go to concert right. like you do. And mm-hmm. they come and, and they listen, and they quite got it. They got it. And they, you know, they, they make some comments. I know they... they kind of got it. I don't know whether they got it from how musical uh, it is, but it's it's not in, in the musical sense, perhaps it's just the, the message that I try to deliver, the power of music that reached them through my music, because you have to it's just like a words, you know, everybody writes a, a poem or write a drama right. and, and, and certain drama just get you more. And it's mm-hmm. all because how you set up and structure. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and I think that that's amazing thing, isn't it? Is it not? I I I read that you were part of the uh, Silk Road project, weren't you? Uh, in some capacity. Yes, I. I uh, with with Yoyoma and uh, and and I think you were here at the University of Washington, uh, where I am, for a while. Oh, uh, you are, oh yeah. Okay. Did you teach there? I yeah, yeah. I did a one one year residency there. Yes. So, I mean, what I'm trying to get to here is the intention and sort of, let's say, the politics of the Silk Road project and what you're describing can be understood. I mean, the way I would like to read it is it is an important thing to do in the world today, is it not, to kind of bring about translations across cultures in many different forms, Uh at a time of, you know, where everybody wants to say, well, that's something foreign and I don't want to have an yes, answer right. to me. Yeah. So, well, the idea, you know, from Yo-Yo and is, is music is a universal language that, um, that uh, you just need it to, uh, to bridge them. And, and so that was, he specifically set up this to deal with, with that problem. You know, on the other hand, uh, one time it was Santa Fe mm-hmm. Chamber Music uh, Festival where I was composing residence for one summer, and they brought my music along with Mozart to these uh, Pueblos, you know, these local Indian tribes. Yeah, yeah. And they play as part of their outreach effort, and they they came back told me they they the, the audience liked my music a lot better than Mozart. <laughs> I think the culture of Mozart, his aristocratic kind of culture, was mm. really far from Indian. So my music, which has some Tibetan influence, Chinese influence, uh, and the feels maybe a little bit closer to to what their their culture is. Mm. So I don't know. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, there is a sort of an ethos of very culturally specific high culture sort of reading of music and culture but then there is also a more um, and, down and, to earth yeah i and mean you can connect you know uh, we all should thank bartok uh, for the bella oh. bartok bella yeah. bartok was the first composer in my opinion that made that connection you know using folk music he wasn't the first one everyone did you know right. even from the early you know early music when whenever there's music there's always secular music and street music mm-hmm. and and so a sacred music and a secular music mm-hmm. so you have these uh, always a, a combination when people write and uh, and what whatever is popular there's always in people's mind to to combine those uh-huh. but but what Bartok did was really to uh, to show the audience that the peasant music that put together next to the so-called aristocratic fine arts uh-huh. is just as good. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. you don't really need to uh, look down upon one or just take take the exoticism and bring that into your work. It's just there as good. So he tried to uh, bring out the smell mm-hmm. of the earth, so to speak, uh, next to the, you know, the smell of the earth wasn't considered something refinement. Right. In, you know, in, in the 18th century, 19th century, uh, European aristocrat- aristocratic society. Right. So, so we all th- should thank Bartok for that. Yeah, and at the same time, you know, it's very personal, uh, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I'm, I, when I read your description of the temple, an abandoned temple, the cultural revolution, the violence, and the kind of for all these things that went down, uh, in many ways, that seems to me resonated very autobiographically to you. Uh, I mean, your biography and the way you describe your experience in China and leaving China and parents uh, being sent reform school and so on under part of the Cultural Revolution. It's it's a very personal biographical element to the piece that we were talking about at the same time, isn't there? Well, every piece is a biography, autobiography for me. Every piece, because me, it's uh, me. Uh, it, it is retelling my story mm. uh, through me. Whatever the story was, it was either about the life I lived or 
totally in an abstract form. Even if I write some, I've written pieces on the subject. For example, I wrote a piece for cello and and piano yep. for the Northern Lights. It was inspired by Norwegian folk songs, and then also uh, something you know. Uh, Hans Christian Andersen, mm-hmm. you know, so so it was not. I don't intentionally using any, say Chinese or Asian elements in the mm-hmm. in the works, but still I think there, there are things seep through. I I cannot change it. Right. Even I'm speaking in English, I have accent. I make mis- mistakes, and my Chinese is not perfect anymore. So I am a total mixture. So it's my life experience that that. Will inevitably represent it in the mm-hmm. in the in the composition, no matter how hard I I try not to do that. So I don't try to hide. I just present them more nakedly, so so you can kind of see, hey, this is what I am. What is your sense of modern composition uh, in China today? Is it thriving? Or do you think it's going somewhere? I What think China think? is pretty much uh, connected to the rest of the world, more to Europe than maybe to the U.S. Because mm. in Europe there there are still uh, residues from the tw- late 20th century. Um, avant-garde kind of residual is quite overwhelming yeah. and and China is still a lot of people some quite some of them are quite talented still doing that I, I mentioned in the talk in, in middle theater mm-hmm. that uh, you know the reason that uh, a lot of people flocked to write 12 tone music a hundred years ago mm-hmm. was because it's so easy You know, it's like you know, all of a sudden you have a formula, and anybody could be architect.、Mm. You can build houses, buildings. I you, see. If, but、yeah. uh, that's not true in architecture. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you can't have a formula and just build、uh, buildings. They're gonna fall. But in music, you know, and everybody, and some of them became quite successful. So、mm. that's part of the reason. But that that that. Does that mean there are not great pieces written in that genre、mm-hmm. um, or in that language? But they had a formed a trend of kind of abstract,、um, dissonant, difficult to understand music.、Mm-hmm. Uh, that becomes a given in a way. So this is the music. Okay, it, it, you don't have to know it. it. That's what it is. And if you don't understand it, that's not. It's it's. It's your problem because you're just not good enough,、right. and so that kind of thing. And and that's、um, in China, a lot of young people still kind of in that mood. In in the U.S., that's getting less and less. Just、right. few places, like you know, some of the universities has the composition department still have that kind of aesthetic right, issues. Right.、Mm-hmm. So that's why I I prompt me to talk about what is the music of our time.、Mm-hmm. There's There's no such a thing called the music of our time. Like you talk about architecture of our time, what is you know? Right, right, right. If you right. think about the whole world, yeah, you can think of the U.S. maybe in a certain forms, and、uh, you know, and and but、uh, but in 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 the world, what is the what is the architecture of our time? <laughs> sure, that's sure. Ab, you know, absurd question. Well, okay, as we move towards the end over here. Uh, at the same time, I would say that、uh, you are, I would argue, more unique amongst contemporary American composers who actively,、uh, well, actively or autobiographically, or like you said, at this point you don't really think about it, but it comes through anyway. Do the work of cultural translation, if you like. There are a lot of、uh, you know Asian origin musicians, performers, architects,、uh, etc., who are in the cultural sphere. But mostly, what I see, and yeah, and you know, I, I don't know much about, like I said, about music and so on. But mostly, what I see, they are you know virtuosos, of fantastic performers in the genre in which they are embedded. So I feel that、uh, you know it's inspiring to see what you do. Like for instance, in my field in architecture, I can't think of any you know South Asian origin architect practicing in the United States whose architecture I would describe as being actively、uh, influenced by South South Asian or Indic forms. So what about Ian Pei? Well, Ian Pei, sure. I mean, I don't know if I would describe. 
he's you know Stark's very significant, fantastic, a minimalist modernist um, is how I would describe it. I'm not sure I would describe his work as you know the Louvre influenced or the museum in DC influenced by Chinese monastery in any way distinctly. Uh, I'm not sure. But he designed before he passed away uh, about ten years ago, a little bit longer maybe. Uh, a museum in Suzhou, which is the you know Venice of Venice. China, and he did it. It's quite interesting the way he did it, and it's Asian and uh, modern architecture kind of combined. So it's in him whether that was right. sometimes obvious or not. I don't know. Artists or even composers of his generation was would uh, you know consciously. Um, try to hide this kind Fetic. of thing yes. and they, they try to you know bring out the, the modern part but i think it's sometimes still seeps through aesthetics you know even yo yo ma you know when i yeah. first met him uh-huh. um he was you know he didn't play much of asian music or anything he, he had asian heritage in a way he was really rebellious against that because his parents was like a, a little bit like a me that, you know, brought up in China and then went to study in the West. Yeah. So yeah. so he was kind of res- resentful of what he's... But his music, his phrasing, you know, even when he played Dvorak and Mozart, it sounded Asian to me. Hmm, it did. I mean, I cannot put in words. I cannot hmm. really analyze it. But the first time I heard him play, he, without knowing who he was, at, you know, on the radio... Yeah. And I said that you know that sounds Asian. No, uh, for some really. And, oh. Yeah, and it, he was playing Mozart or whatever he was playing Brahms yeah. maybe. Uh-huh. And and so I actually never had this conversation with him. Mm. But it's it's in his blood. I don't know. He was born in Paris, never lived, you know, in in, in Asia. Mm-hmm. Um, although he claimed his first language is is Chinese. So I think things like this um, sometimes it's. Difficult. So to answer your question, I think what I do, um, it's, you know, I don't think I certainly at this moment or for the last few few uh, decades that I stopped thinking about what is Chinese or what is Asian, what is Western. I don't think about that. And I just try to write good music that me as an audience, in, in as a member of the audience, it would touch me, would move me, um, and and so that's that's my goal, and and if that makes any difference with other people's music, that's great, but um, that that is how I see my music and my function because, you know, to be honest, even if you try one way or the other, you can't help the fact that you you are by you know bilingual that you are by mm-hmm. culture. Um, the, your life, every bit of your life experience will seep through through your work. Once your technical aspect that reaches certain uh, efficiency, the, the, the technique is just to get rid of the barriers so of your expression so you can e- express yourself more freely without, like a pianist, you know, or a cellist, if right. you can't even get the notes right, and then you're struggling with the notes, of course you have you have big trouble mm-hmm. uh, to expression. Uh, no matter how well you want to express yourself, it's it's a problem. But if you if you reach certain technical level, then you don't really think so much about technical thing, which we still do. But but at least you can you can overcome that, and and using your expression, they can overcome. The technical part. Now, your first, uh, your your all your initial training in music uh, was in China. Would you say there's a difference in the basic uh, techniques in uh, oh, yes, very different China? Than China. Yeah. yeah, I have been very lucky that I had great teachers um, uh, in China and outside China, mm-hmm. and, and through the availability of the internet nowadays, everybody take advantage of that. Yeah. So I think. You know, it's like the Indian food in in the U U S and mm-hmm. and then go to India have the India food. Yeah. That's a very different uh, Indian food. <laughs> right. Of course, of course. And All right. So it's the same thing. So you, if you teach, 
you know, in China, you have Western music teaching, and then you, you come to the West, and that's another, you know, it's a very different training or concept. Well, on that, uh, Bright, I thank you very much for taking time and uh, talking to me on this podcast. Uh, I hope uh, that that concert at the Tire happens. If so, please do let me know. I'll look, Maybe I'll jump around and come, come and listen to it. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is Vikram Prakash, your host, and our producer is architect and fellow architectural thinker, Sammy Prouty. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. And if you did, please do remember to subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have suggestions for new topics or guests. You can reach out to us via our website or Instagram. See you next time.